Hey everybody, good evening. Uh, sorry, the pre-roll was a little bit longer than usual tonight. We had a little stream weird uh, fart thing happen there, so I just kind of let it run till, till it cleared itself out, but we appear to be good now, and we can start the show. And how, oh my God, so Dinesh is the first one to say hi. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, big shout out to our friend Dinesh, who we actually got to give a ride to at the Daytona um, showcase event in our Project Corvette last Saturday. It was really, really fun uh, meeting one of our viewers and giving somebody a little, little thrill ride. Hope you had a good time, and um, it was nice, nice to meet you, man, and it was nice to um, have you ride shotgun in one of our Project cars, and thanks again for watching. Folks, uh, good evening. This is Wednesday. It is time for another edition of Grassroots Motorsports Live. I'm JG Pastor Jack. Uh, we are presented by CRC Industries. They are the folks that make this show possible. Also, our great friends at Coney Shocks and Auto Books, Aero Books out in Burbank, California. We're telling you more about those folks as we get into the show. So thank you for joining us. Here's what I want you to do, though, before we get going. Um, go down, whatever, wherever you're watching us. If you're watching us on Facebook, if you're watching us on YouTube, I want you to uh, give us a little bit of love. If you're on uh, Facebook, throw us a like, throw us a share. That means a lot to us. If you're on YouTube, uh, throw us a, um, a subscribe. Hit that little button that says subscribe, and you'll get notified whenever we post new content to the Grassroots Motorsports YouTube channel. All right, here's what we are doing tonight. Again, I'm going to talk a little bit about corner weighting, why it's important, how you do it, um, how, how it can affect your car, how you actually go through the process. And we're going to be using this 2004 BMW M3 as a demonstration. We actually just bolted a set of Bilstein coilovers on this M3. And we're going to show you how you can easily adjust your corner weights using those coilovers and um, and how exactly that affects the handling. That's why I'm not wearing a themed merchandise gear tonight because I'm going to be pulling wheels on and off and taking tires on and off. And I don't want my friend Nancy to get all mad that I'm getting my official Grassroots Motorsports staff shirt dirty. All right, so let's, let's just start kind of getting into it and... Um, if somebody joins us late, we can we can catch up a little bit. By the way, if you have any questions at any time during these proceedings, throw them in the chat on Facebook, uh, throw them in the chat on YouTube, and we will try and address them uh, as as best we possibly can. All right, so let's talk a little bit uh, first conceptually about the concept of corner weighting. I want you to to uh, to imagine a car in motion. Um, and, and imagine that it's got four contact patches with the ground. It's got, you know, each of those tires is creating a, an independent contact patch with the ground. And the weight of that car statically, you know, if the car is not moving, the weight of that car is distributed throughout those four contact patches. There's a center of mass in this car, which, which is the, uh, the, the main focus of what gravity is acting on in that car, pulling it down towards, towards the ground. And each of those contact patches has to bear a slightly different burden based on where that center of mass is located, uh, based on different leverages throughout, throughout the car, different distributions of physical components and um, different, different sort of angles that, that things are sitting at. We're going to get into some of the specifics of things you can actually change to affect your, your, your corner weights. So let's talk about um, why corner weights are important. And I want you to imagine, we've established that we have, we have separate contact patches that the uh, car is sitting, sitting on the ground. So we can, we can sort of group those into a right and left uh, set of contact patches or a fore and aft set of contact patches because in general the uh, the right side of the car is going to sort of act um, congruously with itself just as the front of the car is going to act congruously with itself the the back of the car or the uh, left side of the car at, as it were so we can sort of sort of start talking in broad terms about about these halves of the car so we talk about that I want you to imagine um, Okay, imagine two balls. Wait, okay, maybe not. 
uh, imagine two spheres of differing masses. Like imagine a, a baseball and a softball. And those, that baseball and that softball are traveling in a direction and they're going the exact same speed. Now, they both weigh different amounts. So uh, your, your baseball, a couple ounces lighter than the softball. So they're both traveling the same speed, both covering the same distance over the same time. That softball, which has more mass, has more inertia because it is traveling at the same speed, but it has more mass. So it's going to be harder to change the direction of the, that larger, heavier softball than it is that smaller, lighter baseball. You can think about your car in the exact same terms. If the front end of your car has more mass than the rear of your car, it's going to be more difficult to change the direction of that front end of the car than it is the rear of the car, likewise left and right. So we've established that we have these masses moving through uh, <laughs> moving, moving through the air. <laughs> yeah, I'll show you two balls. That's great. It's turned into one of those shows already. We are so tired. We are, we, the last two weeks have been uh, literally the, the MIDI, uh, getting an issue out the door. So, so finishing a MIDI program, doing the MIDI. Thanks you for everybody who, uh, who attended the MIDI and said hi. It was a fantastic time. And then we, uh, we just sent the, an issue of Grassroots uh, to the printer last night. And on top of that, I got Michael McDonald stuck in my head since Monday night. And I'm, I'm listening to, uh, to What a Fool Believes on repeat over and over in my brain. I'm getting ready to just set my face on the table saw and just cut him right out of there. So that's, that, that's, that, that might be towards the end of the show. I mean, like, there's no way to get Michael McDonald out, out of your head. There really isn't. It's, it's sad. That perfectly feathered, uh, you know, kind of parted in, in the middle mullet that he's got. It's beautiful. It's so smooth. Okay. So back to this. So... We have these differing masses sitting on, sitting on different contact patches and we're trying to, trying to get them balanced. Why are we trying to get them balanced? Well, uh, maybe it's wrong to say we're trying to get them balanced. We are trying to uh, have knowledge and have specific information about what each of those contact patches is doing. So we know if they are balanced, they are all holding the same load, they're all gonna take roughly the same amount of energy to change directions because they all have similar masses sitting upon them. So changing the, the, the directions is going to take similar amount of effort. So what, what's that mean? It means your car is going to turn left just as well as it turns right. Um, it means when you are braking or accelerating, you're not going to have any, any additional uh, mass issues going one way or the other. So the General layout of cars is the biggest thing that fights us with this. If, you, if you're talking about a front wheel drive car, you're talking about a car with all of its mechanical bits packed in the front end. You're talking about an engine, a transmission, two axles, a cooling system, all of that stuff packed over this front axle, putting a lot of weight on the front axle. Ultimately, there's not much you're gonna be able to do about moving that, that weight rearward. But there are some advantages to, uh, to having that weight up there in that your, your, your mass is right over your drive wheels. Uh, and even though as you accelerate, it shifts that mass towards the back dynamically and wants to lift those front wheels off the ground, you still have mass over, over those, th those front wheels creating you know, what, what little traction you have left. So when you're talking about making changes in, in broad strokes, only so much you're gonna be able to do within the mechanical limitations of the car. Now you can do some things uh, where you, you take large pieces of mass and move them around the car as your rules allow. The battery is a perfect example. A battery is 30 to 40 pounds for, for most cars. If you can take 30 pounds off the front of a car, move it to the back of a car, you're talking about a 70, you know, 60 pound, 70 pound weight shift for a, for a 35 pound battery. Um, so you're, you're, you're talking about, um, you know, a, a significant percentage of the entire uh, weight of, of the car moving towards the back. Uh, so you also have some leverages that you have to deal with. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, never mind. Okay, it, 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 please, please, please stop commenting with Mike McDonald lyrics, or it's going to be a short, 
short show and most of it is going to be me crying. Um, all right, so we, we've, we've, we've established that we're moving this, this mass around in space. Um, we also have leverages to deal with. We have, um, okay, this, this is going to turn into a very, very long conversation, but we have something called polar moment to deal with, which is essentially um, the car is going to want to rotate around its center of mass. When, when you're changing direction of, of, of a car, I'm looking for something around here to use as a, as a, uh, a visual aid. Um, it, a, a mass, uh, a, an object is going to want to rotate around its, its, its center of mass. For, for this screwdriver, we can, we can actually find its, its balance point, which is slightly behind the center. If we flip this, we'll see that it's going to rotate around around that point. It's a little bit back heavy. So as it flips, you can, you can actually see the rotation change to where it, it, it's actually rotating around that center of mass, which is a little, a little rearward of the geometric midpoint because most of the mass is stacked in the back. A car is the same way. If you, if you turn a, a car, its natural tendency is going to want to be to rotate around wherever its center of mass is. Now, for most cars, a center of mass is going to be fairly near the geometric midpoint of, of the car, a little bit, uh, you know, depending on, on the actual um, configuration of the car, probably a little bit below the belt line and maybe a little bit forward of a midpoint. We'll actually show you, show you, you know, some, some ways to calculate um, that while we're doing our corner weighting. So, let's get updated on any questions here. <laughs> Ian says we're way past bleach on uh, on cleaning these shirts. Yeah, I I, I do I do not want to have to have to explain to uh, to somebody why I got my Jerem staff shirt all stinky because um, they're nice and I want to preserve them. So back to corner weight in this thing. So we we want to create as balanced of a setup as possible given the physical limitations of the car we are presented with. Now this M3 actually makes a, a, a great example because it is a naturally very well balanced car and we'll see that in a couple minutes when we throw it on on these scales and do an initial initial weighing. David, did you just post a uh, Michael McDonald video in, in, in the chat? Yeah. <laughs> oh great. Yeah, oh God. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn these scales on quick. Uh, you guys watch out Michael McDonald video. Uh, that'll be some nice scale turning on accompaniment music. And we'll do an initial way of this, this car and see kind of where we're at. Now, I'm gonna give you a couple disclaimers because some of the stuff we're doing here, we're, we're kind of doing for, for the camera and it's not the way you would actually, actually do it in a, in a shop scenario. Um, but it would be difficult to, for us to set up the, uh, the actual method here and uh, you know, be able to demonstrate it and so, so, you, so you can see what's going on. In general, you're not going to lift a car straight up and set it straight back down on scales. You're, you're going to end up having, um, having some tension introduced into the, um, into the suspension, which could, could throw some, some, some of your weights off unless you have a very, very good set of slip and turn plates. Um, you, you may end up with a little bit of tension in, in the suspension. So you, you kind of want to avoid doing the straight lift and, and straight put down uh, on, on the scales for anything other than very coarse adjustments. For your finer adjustments, you want to roll onto the scales. You, you, you want to basically uh, roll the cars from scale ramps or from a, a setup platform onto your scales. And that's, that, that's going to give you a much more accurate measurement because the suspension will be at, at uh, complete rest. 
All right, uh, so Keith wants to know, do you corner weight with the driver's weight in the car? And yes, that's another thing that you will absolutely do. You, you want to corner weight as much as possible with the car in race condition. So that means whatever fuel setting you run at, if you run an enduro car, um, a lot of people like to do a setup with a full tank and with an empty tank and maybe um, a, a, a middle of the road tank to see how much their corner weights will change throughout the process of that, that tank being drained. And from there, it's, it's just kind of a, a, uh, a strategy game to see where you want to bias your, your setup to based on, uh, do you, generally, you will, you will bias towards a little bit, um, a little bit less fuel rather than a little bit more fuel because you're trying to maximize lap times. So you're, you're going to be sort of biasing your ideal setup towards having a physically lighter load overall. So if you're, if you're looking for, for maximum lap times, you, you definitely want to optimize your setup for your fastest possible condition, which is going to be your lightest condition. So, so keep that in, in mind. So uh, we, we don't, you can, you can simulate a driver in various ways. You can actually throw somebody in there who's just going to be sitting in there for a while, or you can uh, put a bucket on the seat filled with uh, sand and weights and um, whatever else you have, have sitting around to basically simulate that weight of whatever weight driver with gear and, and simulate as much of a, an active race condition as, as you possibly can. So for now, just ima actually, you know what, imagine, imagine Michael McDonald is sitting right here in this seat and, and he's gonna be, he's gonna be our, our, our driver. Um, so Andrew wants to do corner weights change with the size of the tires. Um, your contact patch is not gonna change in area. Your, your, your contact patch is only gonna change in shape. So tire size shouldn't have much to do with how the corner weights actually change, un unless, and I'll, I'll get to the unless in a second, but your, uh, your, your, your contact patch, the actual area, the um, physical area of your contact patch is going to remain constant no matter what size tires you have on a car. Only the shape will change. With a, with a tall, narrow tire, you're gonna have a long, narrow contact patch, but it's still gonna be the same number of square inches regardless of of what, what size or what shape tire you have on there because your, your actual contact patch area is a, a uh, physical function of how much weight that corner is, is, um, is holding up. If, if we wanted to get really super granular and, and we had the equipment to do it, we could actually set our corner weights by measuring contact patch area. If we had one of those high-speed cameras that photographs the car driving over a, a, a plate of glass, um, we, could, we could actually measure the, the contact patch area of each of our tires, adjust corner weights based, based on, on that, and um, use that as, as, the, as the metric to get our setting. I would imagine there's probably IndyCar teams, Formula One teams, um, NASCAR teams that spend the money and take the time to, to go to a place that can actually produce those, ki those kind of results to, to be able to set their corner weights dynamically at speed. Um, by, um, you know, by, by, by setting them based on contact patch area. Now, where, where tire size will affect corner weights in a more drastic fashion is if you go to substantially different diameter tires at one end or the other and you create a rake situation. So if you, if you uh, retain the same, same diameter in the front, but you go to a different size tire in the rear that gains in diameter an inch and a half, you're raising the rear end of the car three quarters of an inch because of that additional diameter, you're moving a lot of that, that weight forward. So keep, uh, keep that in, in mind. Uh, so Keith wants to know, do you bias the setup based on prevailing turn direction for the track you're going to run at? I guess the track is run counterclockwise with six turns to the right and three to the left. Um, it, I'm going to give that a qualified yes, but that is a different show, and that is a show more based on data acquisition than a show based on corner weighting. Short answer to that is you, uh, you balance the car for, 
for um, optimal lap times. And the only way to, to truly figure optimal lap times is by taking segment times in each different corner. So you could then use that data to figure out how much uh, time you could afford to give up. For example, um, if you were running uh, Road Atlanta, it's, it's prominently right-hand corners. Well, you, and, and, and you have several really fairly fast right-hand corners, turn 12, turn one, uh, turn six and seven. Um, seven's a pretty, pretty, pretty slow right-hand corner, but you have a lot of very fast right-hand corners. So gaining time in those fast right-hand corners is going to probably be a bigger net gain on lap time than uh, gaining a little bit of time in a 60 mile an hour turn 10A. Uh, I would rather gain a few miles an hour through 120 mile an hour turn 12 than I would through you know, a 60 mile an hour turn, turn 10A. So again, that's, that's a show on data acquisition that we will, we will do at some point, but um, sh short answer to your question, yes, bias, bias for the track when you, when you have the opportunity to do so. Now, in autocross situation, you don't know what you're going to have when you show up. You may have uh, something heavily biased to one direction or the other. An autocross, so for an autocross car, you, you tend to want to go as balanced as possible and you can make make changes to the balance uh, using shock absorber settings, using using sway bar settings, using easier things to adjust than your corner weights. Um, so I hope I hope that answers your question and, and yes there, there is there is a, a, a there's a great show in figuring out how to tune for a specific track that we, we will do someday, um, but not tonight because there's no way I'm going to be able to get through that with, um, a, you know, what a fool believes in, in, in my head. All right, let's take a look at what we're using to uh, to weigh our car. This is a brand new set of Intercomp uh, wireless scales that we got. It's a quick weigh system. I like it a lot. I literally just took it out of the box earlier today, so there's a lot of features on this that I am I am not familiar with yet. I can make a couple of broad generalizations about scales though. First off, the first thing I did was I, uh, I, I turned the scales on, I made sure they synced with the um, head unit and they did instantly and wirelessly. There was no, there was no sync fool arounds. There was, there was no, uh, I didn't, never, never had to hook it to a laptop or anything. They just synced instantly. That was a nice sign. I then took a, a, a known quantity of weight. I had a, I had a, a 10 pound, weight that we use on some of our camera equipment and um, set it on all four scale pads and they appeared to read accurately. I then took that same 10 pound weight and I moved it around the scale pads to see if there was any difference um, in, in location on the scale pads for where I put that weight. And to my extreme delight, there was not, even with that weight hung way out towards one corner of those scale pads, they were fairly, they were, they, they read identical to the weight that they read with the weight in the center. So that was a, a, a nice sign of, um, of a, a quality piece of equipment. Ideally, you, you want to keep your mass towards the center just to be consistent, but it's nice to know that the, really the, the difference between a, a quality scale and a cheap off-brand scale is a quality scale is going, first off, it, it's going to be built a lot more robustly like, uh, like these things are. They're, they're solid aluminum. They, um, well, of course, I could weigh them and tell you I, I can put one scale on another, but then we create a singularity. Uh, but they are, they're nice, thick aluminum. Uh, very, very high quality and very forgiving as far as where you put the mass on there. So uh, th that, is, that is one of the, the clear hallmarks of, of a, a good set of scales over a cheap set of scales. Um, other thing uh, that, that, that sets a good set of scales apart from a cheap set of scales is they will be very consistent throughout a broad range of temperatures. Um, be, because of the way the, the uh, pressure sensors work in some scales, they can be a little bit temperature sensitive and a good set of scales will read very consistently over a broad range of temperatures, uh, whereas a cheap set of scales will have some issues um, as temperature changes. Sometimes your weight will change as well. So um, we will uh, let's deal with a couple more questions here and then we'll, we'll actually see this stuff in action. Max wants to know how do we determine overall level 
on the scales. Um, if you recall from a previous show, you might recognize our um, $50 setup pads we built from some two by sixes. They are, um, they are shimmed actually fairly close to level. A couple of the other ones have some little pieces of, uh, of plywood in, in, in between the layers or um, uh, masonite. Uh, be more specific, and they are they are fairly close to level. Our floor is actually actually pretty darn level in here. A lot of garage floors will actually have a little bit of a slope to them. But you, yeah, you you want to get all four scales as level as possible. You can use uh, a string and a line level. You can use uh, a laser level. Um, you can uh, you know literally stretch a, a a two by four across the pads and put a put a level on it. But yeah, the, the closer you can get um, everything to level, the more accurate and the more repeatable your readings will be. Now, every racetrack we're ever on is never level, but you at least want to start with good solid data before you go to that track so you can repeat it, so you can do it again in, in the same place, and so you can make, make sensible changes. All right, so let's, um, let's take a look at how these babies work. I'm trying to remember not to slam that in the in the hood. So I think I've talked long enough where these have gone into their uh, their sleep mode. So we're going to cycle the power back on these things again. These these, um, these scales have like a, a three minute sleep mode to preserve the batteries where if they don't detect a load after a few minutes they will they will kind of go into a low power mode all right so we will slowly lower the car down on here and remember uh as i said in the do as i say not as i do portion earlier this is not the ideal way to um to corner weight a car by raising and lowering it from a from a, a, a single point, you, you you want to roll onto your scales if you can. But this is the concession we've made for for television tonight. So we're dropping slowly onto our scales, increasing our load till the entire car is resting on there. And then we'll be able to look at our corners and make some assessments. Okay, so here's where we're starting out. Total weight, 3,384 pounds. Here are our individual corner weights at each corner. Here's one of the things I really dig about, um, about these intercom scales is you can select individual weights. Like if I want to see just the left side weight, I can select both those weights and I can see we've got actually exactly 50% on the, on the left side. And if we select the right, we'll see we have well 49.99% on on the right, so I'm guessing if we go back to our left, we'll see we have uh, yeah 50.0. So we're missing a, a hundredth of a of a percent in there somewhere. Um, that's that's for Michael McDonald. That's that's his spirit lifting up to God is is what that uh, that tenth of a percent is. Fairly accurate though. Um, if we want to see just the weight on the front, we can select just these fronts, and we can see that we've got. Um, Wow, and actually, actually a very nice 50-50 uh, split, 50.01, rear, 50 and a, and a half on the, on the right, 49 and a quarter on, on the left. So a very, very well-balanced car side to side and front to back in general. 
Now let's take a look at our cross corner weights, which is going to be the uh, the main thing that affects, especially our our turn in percentage. When you you turn a car into a corner, let's say you're turning into a uh, a right hand corner, since this is on 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 the side of the um, the lights. You turn the wheel to the right. First thing that's going to happen is as your weight transfers this way, it's going to load this left front tire. As this left front tire loads, your right rear tire is going to be the tire that unloads the most. So these are going to be your two most affected tires in any corner are going to be your cross corner tires because as you are as you are loading the front end of that car, you're also creating you're you're creating not only a torque that is pushing the weight to the outside of the corner, you're also creating a, a, a substantial torque that's pushing that weight forward as that friction of, of, of that, that tire turning pushes the back of the car up and pushes the front of the car down. So in any corner, your, your most affected corners are your, your cross corners. So that's why we want, we want to talk about getting those cross corners as equal as possible for setting our corner weight. So let's take a look at where we are on our cross corners here. We can see we are about two and a half percent off um, on our left front and and right right rear. Dave's gonna come over and take a picture, I think. Oh, <laughs> uh, we got uh, we got uh, mutant truckers going up, going up and down the road. So we are, uh, we're a little light, let me, photo break, I'm turning this around because I'm literally too tired to do it in my head and figure out which corners I'm looking at, so I have to orient it with the car. We are, we are a little bit light on the, uh, the right front and left rear, that is what's keeping us from the, um, the, the mythical 50% corner balance. So what are we going to do uh, to change that, folks? Well, we're going to um, adjust the coilovers that we just installed on this thing. And we're going to do that after some messages from our sponsors. Uh, guys, you know what time it is. It's time to talk about our friends from, uh, from CRC, our friends from Coney, uh, our friends from Autobooks, Aerobooks. Let me get caught up on uh, any questions. Um, so Keith um, wants to know, do we have uh, driver weight in the car? 50-50 uh, front, 50 left, but no driver. Yes, well, we, we, have, we have no driver in, in the car right now. Ideally, you would want to do this with the driver, so these numbers will be off a little bit. The physical principles we're displaying are still going to be, still going to be accurate, though. Um, like I said, just, just pretend there is somebody in the driver's seat, and w when we show you how we're, we're moving weight around, the same thing will apply with, with a driver in there. So Max says, uh, always be careful when you drink scotch whiskey all night long, uh, so you don't uh, die behind it. Don't, don't try and sneak that stuff in. I mean, no, no, we're, 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 we're not, we're not talking, we're, we're talking about, about the, the good, we're talking about Michael McDonald, we're talking about Kenny Loggins, we're talking about the, the, the the classics, not not uh, what what's 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 his name, not um, the, the the Steely Dan stuff stuff there. Don't um, don't don't bring that weak sauce this way. Um, okay. Oh, Robert asked about uh, the scales need, need to be zeroed. Yes, we zeroed the scales before before we actually dropped the weight down on them. Um, is a very simple zero function on the scale. The scales are actually far more powerful than I'm giving them credit for. Uh, they will hook to an app. I don't know how to do any of that stuff yet. Uh, we're going to do a, probably another show with the Intercom guys on how to how to actually maximize the use of these things. All I know is I took them out of the box today, and they work fantastic. Right out of the box, they worked and they were accurate. So I'm 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 a happy fella, uh, folks. This is our smart washer from CRC. If I got a chance to use this thing this week, it is awesome. If you are in the commercial areas of the automotive trades or the mechanical trades, I highly recommend one of this. It is uh, very eco-friendly. It is very easy to use and it is very, very effective. If you are not in the commercial trades, uh, CRC has plenty of great stuff for you. This is my new favorite CRC thing here. It's actually empty right now. This is the SureShot. This is 
uh, something you can fill with these gallon containers of brake clean that I'm like, I'm gonna, I'll tear the whole GD thing down if I take those out. You can buy bulk, bulk containers of, of, of brake clean, pour them right in here, pressurize it, spray as much or as little brake clean on something or any other chemical that, that, that you want. It is literally my, uh, my new favorite CRC thing because I can just hose brake clean on something to my little heart's content. Um, and you can get these on Amazon, they're fantastic. Um, and you can get those gallons of brake clean. They're like the gallon. The gallon of brake clean is like twenty bucks. It's super cheap, and these are like fifty or sixty, and worth every every dime. I am a huge, huge fan. Check them out, of course, at crcindustries.com. Check them out at major retailers like AutoZone or like Napa or like uh, O'Reilly Auto Parts. And uh, if we're lucky here, where's my brake clean pro? Yes, uh, brake clean pro series is in stores now. I actually saw some in the wild the other day. Biggest complaint about brake clean, folks, is uh, you're always running out of it. And this, these brake clean pro series, nearly twice the size of regular size brake clean cans. The they were originally only available to uh, to the trades, but people found them so popular that brake uh, the CRC decided to throw them in stores where little old folks like you and me can go and buy them. And they are they are fantastic. Uh, <laughs> everybody, yeah, we, we, we uh, everybody's mentioning that we had a Maybach last night. Uh, for some weird reason, the press car folks dropped off a Maybach last night. We didn't get to get it on the scales, unfortunately. Um, I, I, I think it probably, the, 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 the readout on the scale probably would have just said, you're not cool enough to weigh this car. I, I, I think I think is what, what would have happened. I uh, also want you guys to check out our friends at Auto Books, Aero Books, the world's greatest bookstore. They're in Burbank, California, and on the web at autobooks-aerobooks.com. If you're learning to set up a car, they have all the Carol Smith books. They have um, Fred Poon's books. They have pretty much any book on setup you could ever possibly want. Go there, buy it, support brick and mortar bookstores, support people selling uh, books with ink on pages in them, and we would really, really appreciate that, and they are great folks to work with. And now we're going to see the Coney tip of the week, folks. Coney Shocks su supplies us with a very cool tech tip every week or a little inside look at the workings there at Coney. This week we're gonna see a little bit about how they dyno test shocks. We're actually gonna be following this video up next week with um, a little more information on how to read those shock dynos. So lots of suspension tech going on on the live show this week and next week. So uh, without further ado, let us go to this week's Coney tip of the week. If I can find it here, here we go. It's gonna be magic. Hello, this is Lee Grimes with Coney Shock Absorbers. I'm at the Coney America Engineering Lab with a shock absorber dyno. Uh, this dyno is a, an excellent tool for us to, to measure and quantify the damping forces uh, that are, the shock absorber is going to be making at a variety of different piston speeds. That information, when plotted in a number of different graphs uh, and printouts, will allow our engineers to help decide what is the best uh, forces and function that are going to, uh, to make the car handle well. The shock dyno is going to operate uh, the shock at a variety of different piston speeds, and then we can plot the data and take a look at seeing what it's doing. Those eagle-eyed amongst you uh, may recognize that this is the front shock uh, from a Mazda Miata 2006 to 2015 MX-5, known as the ND chassis. First, I'll go ahead and get the shock uh, operating a little bit here, and it's beginning to, to plot a, a, a force. The particular setup I've got right now is a single piston speed, and I can increase that speed very quickly as well to give us a different force uh, to begin with. So this way we can plot it out, see what it's doing inside, and, uh, and take it from there. 
Now that we've gathered our, our data sample, next time we'll take a look at this information laid out in a couple of different graphs to help us take a deep dive into the function that the shock absorber is doing. We can begin looking to see where the rebound and compression damping are, where are the changes that are happen when we make an adjustment to the shock, and so on like that. This is going to help us uh, and our uh, users to figure out how the car is going to be affected uh, as, as it's operating on a road. For more information, go to our website, coney-na.com, for much more information about our product lines, uh, the application lookup, uh, new products coming down the road, and so on like that. Thank you very much for your time and for your interest in Coney. Hello, this is Lee Grimes with Coney Shock Absorbers. I'm at the Coney America. Go, go, go. All right, we're back. Thank you very much to uh, the gang at Coney, Lee Grimes and uh, Dave and the whole gang at Coney who provide us their tech tip every week. We appreciate their support. All right, we're going to get um, get some wheels off this baby and we're going to adjust some of these corner weights. I'm going to show you the, uh, the Bilstein shocks we have just put on this car and I need to get a little protective gear on for that. This glove is defective, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. Somebody gave me two left gloves, but I'm gonna improvise. Okay, let's get, let's get this wheel off over here because this is the one we are dealing with. I'm gonna go ahead and take our strings down because we aligned this baby earlier. So we had a couple of questions from our, uh, our Facebook page earlier that I, I, I think were good. They're a little bit out of the scope of this show, but we're gonna, we're gonna deal with them anyway, um, as long as we're talking about, about track setup. Somebody asked, um, is there a way that I can have a track set up and have a street set up and I can change things over when I get to the track. Oh, I hate wheel bolts so much. Where, where I can preserve both setups. And the answer to that is maybe. And here, here's, what, here's what you want to look at. So when Generally, if you're talking about a, a, a street setup and a track setup, you're talking about, about two, two main factors, and that's camber and toe. And depending on the car, they very well could affect each, each other to a, uh, a degree that it's difficult. Yeah, David, grab, grab, the, grab the, the, the double light, because it's, it's plugged in, and that, that, that should reach over here. Camber and toe are gonna, gonna affect each other, or camber is going to affect toe um, fairly, fairly dramatically. Um, oh, here, uh, or you can, you can unplug that one and that, that might reach over here a little bit better. So on our Corvette, for example, um, as, as we, as we lean that knuckle over to, to gain negative camber, it, it moves the bottom of, of, of the knuckle outward, moves the top of the knuckle inward, moves the bottom of the knuckle outward. The steering arm is on the bottom part of, of the knuckle. So, so it moves that steering arm further away from the center of the car. So it changes the toe dramatically. Um, so in, in a case like that, it's gonna be a lot more difficult to have a track set up and, and, a, um, and a street set up because you're gonna have to change a couple different things. Now, if you're willing to take a paint marker, say, and do a setup in uh, a trackway, mark everything with paint, uh, do, change everything, do your street setup, mark everything with, uh, with paint where you can index it visually without having to, to measure anything. Yeah, it, it's gonna take however long it takes, you, it takes you to change over, but it's not gonna be the end of the world. With a strut car like this, it can be a little bit easier because when you're talking about adjusting camber with a strut car, you're, you're, you're talking about either either moving it um, at the knuckle down here, if it's like a Toyota uh, that, that has two knuckle bolts, 
where you're talking about moving it up at the top with the use of a camber plate by tilting, tilting the top of that strut back and forth. If you're moving the knuckle to adjust camber, generally it's going to affect toe a lot more than moving it at, at the top, which is why camber plates are, are actually so effective for, um, for, for dual, dual use cars because you're, you're, you're moving the top of this strut, you're leaning it over, and you're not really moving that steering arm, arm very much. So, uh, long, long way around to answer that question. Can I have a dual street and, and track setup? Yes, uh, you may have to put some work into marking things. If you have a strut car with camber plates, it's gonna be much, much easier because those camber plates are gonna be not only easier to adjust, but they're going to affect your toe a lot less ultimately when you when you do uh, adjust that camber but if you've got a Miata uh, if you've got a Corvette if you have any any double a arm car um, it's gonna be a little bit tougher and if you want to go through the trouble to, uh, to to mark stuff might be worth it um, or you give me the the handheld light there uh, over over um, behind the um, blaster there should be a, a, a free plug that's not worth it. There's no rats here anymore. Here, let's just unplug this. Okay, so let's take a look now at our um, at our strut over here. And of course, the one we want to adjust is the one uh, the fur furthest away from, from from the lights. So this is our our uh, Bilstein coilover. Uh, that we, we just in, installed on, on the BMW here. Uh, nice, nice, nice piece of kit, stainless steel body, um, threaded adjusters here. This is the magic that lets us accurately adjust our corner weights is these threaded adjusters here. We can turn these, move them up and down that, that, that shock body and change the... Um, change the height of each individual corner and along with that, that, that height changing the load on, on that corner is going to change. So since we found that our, our right front and our left rear were the light ones, we're actually going to, going to raise the right front and the left rear just a little bit to put a little bit more weight on, on the right front and the left rear. So why are we raising the right front and the left rear and not lowering the left front and the right rear? Um, we, we, we could we could affect the same things in the same ways. Um, we're doing that because it's a street car. And we, we actually measured our ride heights before and after our, our spring changes, um, wrote them down over on this whiteboard here. We don't really want to, want to um, lose any, any more ride height than we have to. We're, we're not trying to slam the car. Now, if it was a race car, we could uh, we could look at um, you know lowering the, the entire center of gravity, lowering everything. The other thing you want to look at all this all this stuff leads to other other stuff. But other thing you want to look at is once you lower a car, you want to look at the angle of your control arms. Uh, have you changed the angle of, of your control arms? Have you moved your roll centers in in a drastic fashion where uh, you're lowering the car anymore is going to drastically change change your your uh, roll centers. So uh, without being able to correct roll centers on, on this car, we want to make our adjustments to keep things as close to where they were stock as, as, as possible. So I've already uh, scooted this spring up about, you know, about three eighths of an inch, um, th th three eighths to, to, to half, half an inch. We'll scoot our jam nut up there to lock it in. And uh, where did I put my iPad? Did I, did I eBay my iPad and, and forget about it? Um, so it'll 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 turn up at some point. So uh, next we'll move around to. Oh, it's it's totally up here, isn't it? What's that? Oh shit. Uh, okay, we'll find it. Oh, look at that. 
<laughs> where, no, David, that was exactly like my iPad. <laughs> you have the same iPad that I have? No, well, just tired. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't have any. I was I was hitting the peanuts pretty hard though. We, we, we went to a baseball game today, and it was fun. All right, so let's take a look at our, oh, here, let's see if we have any, oh, Kevin Morrison says, it's nice to see his old car again. Yeah, is. is that, is that who, who, who you bought the car from? I did, it's his old car. That is fantastic. So Keith wants to know, are the spring rates the same as stock? Would you want to lower it a little if the springs are stiffer? Uh, the answer is no and yes. Um, we we haven't even had the car on the ground with, with the new, well, I, we had it down on the platforms to measure ride height. We really haven't driven much with with the uh, new new setup. And actually, I, I, I don't know how much stiffer the springs are than the um, stock springs. What's what's the kit, David? What's What, what kit is this from, from Bill Stein? David, David has no idea. <laughs> it's great though. I, I mean, I, 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 I look, I'll, I never read the instructions and I've managed to install the thing and I'm, I'm a barely literate, you know, fourth grade, poor to educated, um, half wit. So, uh, I did a pretty good job. So, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at the, at the, at the rear here. Rears in BMWs, uh, of, of every kind with these semi trailing arms are a little bit of a pain in the butt when it comes to doing doing height adjustments on because what you have to be your your shock and your spring are separate so it's not it's not like a um a coilover setup where your spring is wrapped around your shock you have you have a separate spring that sits in in the control arm and you've got a a, a separate shock so in this case what bill stein has given us is they've given us a threaded adjuster that goes on the uh, the location of the upper spring perch here and provides us a little bit of height adjustment, um, the same way the coilover works, but it's just essentially a threaded, uh, threaded pad that we we can we can add some height to the spring. The rub is to actually adjust it. Uh, you got to you got to undo the shock and lower the control arm down a little bit to actually take enough tension off off the spring to adjust the thing a little bit. So we'll do that in in a second. But in the meantime. Uh, Chris, get get a shot of actually get, get get a shot of the adjusting ring down here. I really do like the way that Bill Stein does the um, the adjusters down there. They're nice and visible. Um, they're 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 really easy to. They, they, yeah, they have a nice positive positive action for you to adjust the rebound on the shocks down there. Nice big index dot. Um, it, nothing worse than having a set of adjustable shocks that are hard to adjust and you don't know where where you're adjusting them to. So I really, really like the way the way Bill Stein did um, did that. Let's get updated on questions here while I grab the um, grab a socket here. So Keith says he has a stock 2002 325 CI with, um, what we go, with 100,000 miles of the OEM shocks and springs. So he's considering the same Bilstein setup. Yeah, I, uh, I, would, I would highly recommend it. Um, it was uh, it was easy to install. It was clearly of a uh, a very high quality, and I can definitely vouch for how uh, how easy it was to put together and and put on the car. Gee, dip. Uh, Eighteen millimeter half inch drive. Not enough, apparently. So I just want to show you guys how these uh, how these rears adjust. So once you take the load off of this control arm, you actually have a little bit more more room to 
um, take take the load off, off this spring and you can then go ahead and crank these adjusters down a little bit there's several different companies that make these these uh, threaded perch adjusters for, for the rear the rears of, of BMWs and they all recommend that you put the threaded perches on top and I, I don't get it um, but it's no easier to adjust when it's on the bottom I actually tried installing them upside down from from the, the way they recommend thinking it would be a lot easier and um, turns out it's not so so for, forget about forget about cheating the system all right so we've Lift that control arm back up into place. Has everybody, has everybody signed up for the Michael McDonald fan club by, by now? I hope. When you uh, when you join that Michael McDonald fan club, you actually get um, a really sweet like a like a Guayabera shirt. Um, you get some uh, just for men hair coloring, and uh, you, you get a beard comb. So <laughs> I really really recommend it for everybody. It's a great deal. It's like it. Well, I, I pay like 460 bucks a year, I, and I, I think that's a good deal. Okay. That's not, not my car. <laughs> so that's that's what it what a little more complicated to to adjust the rears on on these things. Not the worst thing in the world. It's not something you're going to do very often, but um, does, it certainly does not have the ease that a um, that an, an all strut car does or, or an all coilover car does. That's what it basically looks like. We're not going to show you the whole putting it back down process because it looks exactly the same as it did before. But our numbers are going to be perfect right on. Let's go through here and get um, answer some questions. Actually, uh, David, while while we're resetting here, I'll I'll, uh, I'll close things out and let you throw a couple of links up. I want to let the folks know about. Uh, who wants free stickers? Ladies and gentlemen, who wants some free grassroots motorsports stickers? Uh, I, 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 need to, I need to see some, some quality action um, in, in this chat if we're going to give away free stickers before the end of the show. We'll try and deal with some of these questions here. Um, since corner weighting is also affecting side to side ride height, should side to side ride height or cross weight take priority? When you are getting close to 50-50 on corner weight. Great question, Glenn, and that is going to be dependent on a few things. Um, what, what I would prioritize is I would prioritize roll centers at that point, actually. So as I was getting close to the ideal um, height, uh, the uh, ideal load on various corners, I would start looking at what my control arms were doing as far as um, are they re remaining parallel to the ground? Are they going to go up or, or, or down at one end? Push my roll centers even further away from where they, they need to be. So uh, at that point, yeah, I would, I would start prioritizing roll centers instead of, instead of corner weights. Um, 
Max wants to know, uh, would it be easier with a spring compressor? Um, I played around with a couple of different different ways to do that. It's one bolt, take the, bo the, the bottom bolt, bolt of the shock off. That's really the easiest way. If you had like a giant pickle fork that you could you could put in the spring and just use as a lever to compress the spring a little bit, that that would work okay. But you, you have to basically build build the tool. But on this car, it's it, it's one bolt. It's not the worst thing in in the world. Um, let's see. So that was that was Glenn's question. Uh, Zach wants to know: Can he borrow the scales? No, you can't borrow the scales. But you can you can buy you buy your own, and I'm I'm a big fan of these so far. These are the uh, the Intercomp Wireless RFX series. They um, they are oh these massive hulking aluminum things. I mean that's the um, that's what that's like three eighths of an inch thick aluminum plate on um, both at the top and the bottom. These are these are industrial equipment to uh, to to say the least. And we'll throw a link up there to where you can you can get your own set. Um, so Ian said nothing like listening to you while you work on the car on a lift, and then hearing your lift over the radio. Uh, um, Oh wow! So like the, the the lift was causing RF interference on the on the mic. That's that's awesome. We, we got like a like a um, like a Neubotten thing going on here. All right, uh, free stickers. Yeah, let's give away some free stickers. Um, yeah, we give away some free stickers. So 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 we we had a couple questions about about when you start getting close. Um, when, when, when you start getting close on corner weights, close on, on, on ride heights, what do you, what do you favor one over, over the other? I, I, I picked roll centers. Um, again, the right way to tell is gonna be with segment times, but if you've got ride heights that are wildly different from corner to corner, but your, your corner weights are, are, are proper, Time to start looking for other problems. Um, you 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 may have something binding somewhere. You may have something um, not being allowed to move uh, freely somewhere. So you know your 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 ride heights are a good sort of broad indicator. They're both sort of good indicators, both ride heights and corner weights, that you're in the right ballpark. You you know if your if your corner weights are close and your ride heights are not seriously different from from side to side or from from, uh, from, from end to end. You're probably doing something right and your car is probably square to begin with. Oh, uh, we had a great question earlier about using sway bar preload to affect corner weights. And yes, that is absolutely something you can do. And here, uh, Chris, let me grab the light here and we'll walk around the other side and show people what we're talking about. So in the back here, uh, we can see that each side of the car has a has a sway bar end link that connects up to the um, the strut, and that sway bar connects one side of the car with the other. Now, if we had some preload on that sway bar, it would create a side-to-side -side leverage that would affect those corner weights. And the question we had earlier was, is that a good thing? And like most of the stuff, again, the answer is depends. Um, so first off, let's talk about how would we create that, that, that leverage. The only, only way to really create that would be to change the length of your sway bar end link. So you, you would want to basically shorten or lengthen one of the end links to create some, some loaded twist, some, some preload essentially, some tension in that sway bar. Ideally, your sway bar should be sitting at rest with no tension on one side or the other. It should only come, in, come into play when one of those uh, sides of, of your suspension moves independent of, of the other side. So if you introduce some tension in, into that, yeah, you will, you, will, you will create a leverage that will lift one side of the, uh, or attempt to lift one side of the car off the ground and attempt to press the other side of the car into the ground. Now, when would you ever want to do that? Well, the real answer is, you probably wouldn't. You, you would maybe want to do that in a car that only ever turned one direction um, to create some, you know, what they call wedge in a car, to, to preload 
say the um, the right front suspension and um, sh shift weight off off the left rear like you would in an oval track car. So you would only really want to want to do that in in a in a very limited case. Now that said, uh, there there are certain situations where that might be the only chance you have to maybe fine tune some of your corner weights. And a specific situation where that might come up is like in uh, an SCCA street class autocross situation where you're not allowed to change springs, you're not allowed to change ride heights, you're not allowed to, to change the perch configuration on struts, so you can't really adjust those corner weights. But you are allowed to change sway bars at one end or, or the other. So if you really need to introduce a little bit of, of corner weighting into, into something and you have a, a street class autocross car, yeah, you can, you can introduce a little bit of wedge into that car by preloading that, that, that sway bar. Again, it's not something I can, I can really see uh, taking advantage of because in an autocross car, you generally don't want preload going, going one, one way or the other. You want, you want balance. Um, so if you are, if you are doing a, a preloaded bar in an autocross car, chances are you're masking something else that, that should, should be fixed in, in a proper way. But um, I'm not going to say never do it, but I, I will say that um, you're only going to really want to do that if your specific rules situation doesn't let you change your corner weights in, in any other way. So uh, that, that's, that is my position on the, uh, the preloaded sway bar things. Um, so Glenn says, now he needs to add roll centers to the evaluation, just a vicious cycle of corner weight, ride height, roll centers, and alignment. Yeah, man, it, it, like everything changes something else, and that's why this quick show has now gone an hour and five minutes. Uh, so we are going to say goodbye here very soon. Uh, David, did you put a link to our corner weighting story? Like many awesome. Uh, we, there is a great, great story on corner weighting in on the Grassroots Motorsports webpage. You can check it out at grassrootsmotorsports.com. We've got tons of archived editorial on there. David threw up a link to the um, to the corner weighting story where we talk ab about a lot of the stuff we've talked about al already, a uh, little little more in depth. So you can you can get that information there that you can digest uh, at your own pace without me constantly referencing how Michael McDonald is drilled into my skull with his smooth angelic voice and will not leave. And it's, I'm going on uh, 52 hours now with, uh, with um, that, that silver fox in there. Uh, thank you very much for watching tonight, folks. Um, okay, I, I promised you free stickers. Let's give away some free stickers, folks. If you go to grassroots motorsports.com slash, wait for it, free stickers. I know, it's a tough one. We will send you two Grassroots Motorsports stickers for you to affix to anything you like just for being fans of the show. It is our way of uh, showing you guys a little bit of love. Thank you for all the kind words. Uh, thanks for watching this show. Um, thank you for saying hi to us at the MIDI. Thanks for saying hi to us at Daytona next week. We are going to be, I think we're going to, next week we're going to be putting a steering wheel on our Project Corvette. Uh, apparently that is a little bit more difficult than I have given it credit for. So we're going to, going to see if we can get that figured out and see what some of the traps and pitfalls are and share some of those with you so you don't have to, um, have to fall into those same traps and we'll try and try and get that figured out in advance. And we'll be putting a, uh, a very slick Momo steering wheel in our Project Corvette as we sort of get the interior of that thing a little more driver friendly. Folks, thank you very much for watching tonight. Please check out the people that sponsor this show. Talking about CRC, crcindustries.com. Anytime you need automotive chemicals, anytime you need uh, cleaners or lubricants or carb cleaner or engine cleaner or uh, obviously brake clean or something to make a squeaky hinge stop squeaking or something to make a, a quiet hinge start squeaking. They probably have that too because they have over 15,000 products for um, amateurs and professionals alike. Anytime you're at a retailer and you're reaching on a shelf for automotive chemicals and you're grabbing that CRC stuff, you're not just getting a great product, you are getting a product from a company that supports the stuff that we all love to do. I'm talking about 
autocrossing and road racing and stuff like the $2,000 challenge. Fantastic company. We're glad to have them aboard. So just by supporting them, you're giving a little bit back to the world that you love to live in. Also, check out our friends at Coney Shocks, coney-na.com. If you want to order a set of Coney's right now, you can go to that website, coney-na.com. There is a link that will get you um, between $30 and $75 off of a set of four Coney Shocks. That is a heck of a deal. Also, finally, check out our friends at Auto Books, Aero Books, the world's greatest bookstore. If it uh, drives, rides, flies, floats, uh, or helicopters or dirigibles, you can find a book or a magazine or a DVD about it at Auto Books, Aero Books. Check them out on the web at autobooks-aerobooks.com. Check them out in person in Burbank, California, and if you're ever out there, you owe it to yourself to go there. They have author signings every week. They have cruise-ins every week. It's not just a bitchin' bookstore. It is a hub of car culture in Southern California and a half-century fixture there in, in the LA area. So, um, so please check that out. Um, Max wants to know, have we ever done a show on using a lift? Um, no, but that's actually a, uh, a, a, a very, very good idea. I, I will say this. Um, if you need to change the light bulb at the, uh, the above your lift there on a 16 foot ceiling, don't, um, don't put a piece of plywood on the lift and ride it up and change that light bulb without taking your phone with you to call your wife to come and then lower the lift. Um, that is something you definitely don't ever want to do. I don't know anybody that's done that. I can definitely see that being a realistic, realistic thing that, uh, that, 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 that could happen. So yeah, that's, that's, that's my, uh, my, my first tips on using a lift. And uh, yeah, that, actually uh, we, we love doing shows on how to, how to function better in your shop. So we'll add that to the list folks. All right, that's it. Uh, we will see you again next week. Uh, the July issue of Class Classic Motorsports at the printer right now. If you subscribe to Classic, that'll be in your mailbox in about 10 days. And if you read us online, it'll be online in just a few days. And uh, to everybody who is watching tonight, thank you very much. Thank you uh, to Chris Tropia behind the camera. As always, thank you to David Wallens, who is running our social media over there. Uh, we got a great crew, and we appreciate each and every one of our viewers that watch every week. I'm JG Pastor Jack. Thank you very much for watching JRM Live, where the M stands for Michael McDonald, and uh, the live is because, uh, because we love you, folks. And we will see you again next week, Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, right here back in the garage. Good night, everybody.